blessing to be able to be in the house of the Lord, and it's certainly good to see you here this morning. And uh, I, uh, as I was studying this week, and I studying the lesson and preparing, I, I also had some other things kind of running through my mind, and I, I feel like uh, there's some things that uh, probably I've read this week that would be beneficial to all of us. You've probably read them too, but uh, I was kind of thinking about this morning, straying away from the lesson a little bit and just reading some verses and uh, going over those, but we'll, we'll hold off on that for another time, I think, but uh, I will ask you this question and just see if some of you are kind of thinking along the same lines that I'm thinking. How many of you are discouraged this morning? How many of you are discouraged? Think about it. You don't have to raise your hand, but uh, how many of you are tired of hearing about all the bad stuff? I'm tired of hearing it. And I've heard it till I'm sick of hearing it. Tired of hearing about what's going wrong here and what's going wrong here and what this one's doing and what that one's doing. And I say that to say this. What we need to be focused on, I believe, and I think it's easy to get sidetracked when all you hear is gloom and doom. You know, I, as a school teacher for 20, this will be my 29th year, I guess, and a coach for 27 of those, uh, I've dealt with young people for a long time. And if you tell a kid long enough that they're no good and they're not, they can't win, they can't do this and they can't do that, they start to believe it. But if you start to encourage them a little bit and tell them, hey, you know what? You can do it. You might not be able to do it by yourself, but from a coaching perspective, if you'll do your part and you'll do your part and you'll do your part and the coach will do his part, as a team we can be successful. You know, and, and I began to think about that a little bit from a spiritual perspective. And I've heard enough about what we can't do. I've heard enough about how bad everything is because the Bible tells us it's going to be bad anyway. We know that. And so I started trying to look for some things in Scripture that were encouraging and uplifting. Some things that we can do. Because you know what? As bad as things are, we should, we should know that they're going to get worse because the Word of God says they are. But rather than focus on how bad things are, we ought to be focusing on how much the Lord loves us, what He's done for us, and what He has called us to do. Because we have something to be doing in these last days. And you won't do it. I won't do it if I'm sitting around discouraged. I'm not going to do it if I think we're already defeated. We're not defeated, folks. If you know the Lord as your Savior... You're not defeated. The victory's already won. We still got to fight the battles, but it's already won, and we should take some comfort in that. We should be encouraged by that, and we need some motivation. We don't need to hear that all this is going wrong and there's nothing we can do. What we need to hear is all this is going wrong and God said it would, but there's something for us to do. We got something to do, and we need to get up and get busy. And I think from what I see, my perspective, and I'm just speaking from one man's perspective, but what I've seen at Cedar Grove over the last little bit is we have become discouraged and we have sat down and we're doing nothing. We're not doing a whole lot. Attendance is off in Sunday school. Attendance is off in the worship services. Attendance is off here and there. And you can say, oh, that's just a sign of the times. No, it's a sign that we've become discouraged. It's a sign that we're not as committed to serving the Lord as we used to be. It's a sign that things are headed in the wrong direction. And what we need to do as a body of believers, as a group of saved people at Cedar Grove, is to stop that downward spiral, turn back to the Lord, and get busy doing what he's called us to do. Folks, there's no reason for us to come in with long faces on Sunday morning. No reason for us to sit here and look like somebody's kicked our dog up and down the road when, when we're sitting in a, in a worship service. No reason to sit here with a frown on our face while we're singing praises to the Lord. I see it. I see it sitting in the choir. Oh, how I love you. We don't look like we love anybody. We do not look like we came here to worship, ever. I see it Sunday after Sunday. Long faces. 
Folks, I don't know about you, but I go back to that coaching. You know, I coached a long time. And uh, when we lose, we have long faces. When we lose, we're not pleasant people. But when we win, everybody's smiling. They hugging each other. They loving on each other. We did it. We won. Folks, we've won. The battle has been won. We're on the winning side. We ought to look like it. We ought to act like it. And so I've, I've been doing a little reading, and I've got some verses, and, and I thought about reading some of those this morning and talking about that, but we won't do that today. We'll go ahead with the lesson, but uh, I'm going to continue to look and study in that area, and I started it because I need it. But I began to think about it. You know, if I need it, there might be somebody else that needs it. Just a little encouragement, a little reminder of how much the Lord loves us, how much he's done for us. You know, we ought to think every day. We ought to take a few minutes every day just to ponder on what God has done for us, just how good God is, and then what he expects of us as a child of God. And if we do that, I think our attitude would be a little different. I think our, uh, you know, every day we ought to get up and read. We talk about this. We ought to get up and read our Bible every day. We ought to pray every day. We ought to set some time aside for just us and the Lord. And we should do that. And then when we read and we study and we listen to the preaching of the Word of God, we need to get out and live it every day, folks. We need to be, uh, uh, we, need to, we need to live what we say we believe. We need to be the same people out there we are in here. And we need to do it with a smile. Who wants to be an old snob? Nobody. If you tell people, I'm, I'm a child of God, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, and you do it with a frown on your face, who wants that? Who wants it? Live what we say we believe. Get a smile on your face. Be thankful to God for what he's done for us. Folks, we got no reason to frown. God has blessed every one of us in here beyond measure. He has. We all got up in a nice, from a nice bed this morning. We all had breakfast if we wanted it. Mine's coffee. But we all had what we wanted this morning for breakfast. We all got in a nice vehicle when we came to church. We're sitting in an air-conditioned building on a padded pew. What have we got to complain about? What have we got to frown about? Let's get a smile on our face and let's be the people that God has saved us and called us to be. And uh, let's be encouraged. And let's encourage one another. You know, if, uh, if you're saved, if I'm saved, I got something to smile about. I ought to be telling somebody else. I ought to be telling somebody else. And all of us ought to be encouraging one another, lifting one another up. Lord knows there's enough running folks down. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we shouldn't hear where we're wrong because we should. The Word of God shows us where we're wrong. But you know something else? It also shows us the love of God. It also shows us that if we'll be faithful to Him, He'll be faithful to us. It also shows us if we'll keep His commandments and do what He says, that He'll honor that. So we need to hear the good as well as the bad. And, and so I just, I just wanted to hopefully be a little bit of an encouragement to you this morning. And, uh, uh, you know, we all need that from time to time. It's always good to hear about the love of God because, uh, you know, he's, he's one that sticks closer than a brother. He's one that's always there. He's one that won't leave us or forsake us. If you know him, if you know him, you got something to smile about. So I'm going to take that this morning. If I see a frown on your face, I'm going to be concerned about you. If I see a frown, I'm going to be concerned about you because if you know him, you've got something to smile about. You ain't got nothing to frown about today. Okay, with that being said, let's get started. And that eliminated recess today. In last week's lesson, we were talking about, <laughs> we don't get it anyway, do we? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I got y'all. All right, in last week's lesson, we were talking about four people, if you'll remember. We talked about Ahab, Jezebel, Naboth, and Elijah. And, uh, you know, we looked at these four people and we said there were some things we could learn about, or really we looked at two of them together, really, Ahab and Jezebel. But we looked at these people and we said there's some things we can learn that we can apply to our life. And, and we looked at that last week and we went through it. And I'm, I'm going to just quickly review it because I think it's important, but, but it was a pretty long lesson. 
and uh, certainly I'm not going to try to reteach it today. But if you'll remember, uh, Ahab and Jezebel uh, were idol worshipers. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jezebel had convinced Ahab to build a shrine to the Phoenician god Baal. You know, and we, we talked about that last week. And so, uh, obviously, they were practicing idolatry. And, and, and when the leaders are practicing idolatry, many people follow suit. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of related that to America today. Uh, when, when government's headed down the wrong track, a lot of times people follow suit. And that's part of the world in which we live. And, and what's concerning today in America is that people like us that claim to be Christian, that claim to be a child of God, are not really doing anything. We're just sitting back letting it happen. And, uh, you know, and Brother Steve has said this before, and I agree, picking up a sign and walking around demonstrating is not the way to go. The way to go is to take the gospel out and tell people that they need to be saved. Show them. Are we doing that? You answer for yourself. But uh, at any rate, uh, Ahab and Jezebel were idolatrous. But there was a man named Naboth, if you'll remember, who put his faith in God. He trusted in the Lord. And uh, he got caught in a bad situation, didn't he? He was just trying to be obedient to the Lord, obedient to the word of God, and uh, it, it, it cost him a little bit. And you say, well, you know, I thought you just said if we're a child of God, the Lord will protect us, he'll preserve us, he'll take care of us. He will. He will. But sometimes as a child of God, we have to go through some things. You know, and a lot of times when we have to go through some things, we begin to lose our faith. We begin to question the Lord. We begin to question, why does this happen to me? Why is all these bad things happening to me? I'm trying to do what's right. Well, Naboth was a man who was trying to do what's right. So if you feel like you're, a, you're somebody who's trying to serve the Lord, and every time you turn around, something bad's happening, you're not the first one that ever happened to. You're not the first one. And you won't be the last. See, the Lord's ways are much higher than ours. His understanding is much greater than ours. He knows what's best, and he has a will and a purpose for everything that happens. Things don't catch him off guard. Things don't surprise him. And things don't happen for no reason. So at any rate, Naboth was trying to hold true to the word of God, and, uh, and it cost him a little bit. And then, uh, or in fact, it cost him a lot. And I'm going to ask you this, how many of us would be willing to be Naboth? We'll get back to that in just a moment. But, uh, and then there was the prophet Elijah, and Elijah was a man of God. He was a prophet who was given the task of telling the king the truth. How many of us are willing to go to somebody, especially somebody that's in a position of authority, and tell them something they don't want to hear? We won't even tell our own friends and family something they don't want to hear. Because I can assure you, every one of us in here knows somebody that's lost. Every one of us knows somebody that's lost. How many of us have gone to them and talked to them about their salvation? Well, I don't want to offend them, or I don't want to make them mad, or, you know, if I, if I try to talk to them about the things of God, they shut it down, they tune me out, and I don't want to cause hard feelings in the family. Folks, there's going to be some hard feelings in the family when they get cast into hell and you didn't tell them. So we're not doing them any favors. If you love somebody, if you care about somebody, you ought to tell them the truth. And quit worrying about what it might cost you. You see, folks, I, I'm, I'm convinced today that the majority of us today, when we consider serving the Lord, when we consider doing something for God, before we do it, we weigh the cost. What's it going to cost me? What's it going to cost me? What are other people going to think if I go stand out in the parking lot at Walmart and hand out Bibles? What are people I work with going to think about that? I would hope they would think that man's practicing what he says he believes. But if they think otherwise, so be it. So be it. We ought not weigh the cost. We ought to do what the Lord says do and face the consequences. Whatever it costs, it's worth it. Even if it costs us our life like it did Naboth, it's worth it. So if we quickly summarize last week's lesson, I wanted, I'm just going to do it with Scripture real quick. 1 Kings 21, the first part of verse 2 there says, And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. So Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard because it was right there, it was convenient, and he just wanted it. He was the king, 
If he wanted it, he ought to have it. But Naboth refused to give it to him or sell it to him or even trade the vineyard to Ahab because the law of God forbade it. Look at 1 Kings 21, verse 3. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. He was standing on the word of God, standing on principles. He inherited that property from his fathers, and it was not for him to give it away or sell it or trade it. So Ahab, what did he do? He went home and pouted, didn't he? Basically like we do today. If he don't, we don't get our way, we pick up our bat and ball and go home. Well, that's what he did. And uh, 1 Kings 21, the end of first vo- uh, verse 4 there says, And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. And Jezebel, his wife, saw his reaction to the fact that he couldn't have that vineyard, and so she decides she's going to get it for him. Look in 1 Kings 21, at the end of verse 7, she tells him, I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And so she began to implement a plan to do that. So what was her plan? Well, in, in 1 Kings 21 and verse 8, we see that she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent them out to the leaders of the city. And the letters instructed the leaders of that city to hire two sons of Belial that would go out and that would be present at a, at a fast and they would, they would say that uh, Nahab had committed blasphemy against God and against the king. And of course we know the punishment of blasphemy is death. So Ahab was then to be stoned to death as a result of this crime that he was supposed to have committed, which we know was not the case. He didn't do that. But these two people had been hired for a price. They sold him out. For a price, they said he committed blasphemy. So here's this man who's done nothing wrong except tried to honor God and refuse to give the king his property. That's all he's done. He's done nothing wrong. But he's been falsely accused, and then, and then he's executed. He's stoned to death. And so once the plan had been carried out, word was sent to Jezebel. 1 Kings 21, 14. Then they sent to Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And so then she goes to Ahab, her husband, the king, and tells him to go take possession of the vineyard. 1 Kings 21, verse 15. There at the end of the verse says, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And Ahab took possession then of Naboth's vineyard. Uh, In 1 Kings 21, there at the end of verse 16, it says, the Bible says, Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, and take possession of it. So he takes it. He takes something that wasn't his. And he asks no questions. I don't see anything in the word of God where Naboth says, wait a minute now. Excuse me, where Ahab says, wait a minute now, what happened to Naboth? What's going on here? I don't see anywhere where she tells him, when she tells him she's going to get him the vineyard, where he says, wait a minute now, he has a right to have that, it's his, he refused it, that's fine. I don't see that. What I see is a king who wanted something and pouted because he didn't get it, and an evil wife who comes to him and says, I'm going to get it for you. And he asks no questions. He don't care how she gets it, he just wants it. He's as evil as she is. And uh, so, basically, it seems at this point that Ahab has gotten what he wanted and Jezebel's gotten away with murder. That's what it looks like, isn't it? That's not the case. Because then Elijah comes on the scene. And God instructs him to go to Ahab. And here's one thing I thought was so interesting in the lesson last week. God told him to go where and find him? In his vineyard? Where did he tell him he could find him? In Naboth's vineyard. Naboth was dead. That was Naboth's vineyard though. It wasn't Ahab's vineyard. God says go find him. You'll find him in Naboth's vineyard. That's where he's at. Looking around, looking at what he's just acquired, he thinks. So he goes there and he gives him a message and and, uh, of course God's message to Ahab is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 21. You can read and, and, and we read several verses there, but in verse 21, excuse me, verse 19, the Lord speaks directly to Ahab himself about what's going to happen to him. And then in verse 23, if you skip down, he didn't leave Jezebel out either. He tells him what's going to happen with her. 
At the end of verse 19, thus saith the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Ahab's going to pay for what he's done. He's going to pay with his own life, and the same thing that happened to Naboth is going to happen to him. He's going to die right there, and the dogs are going to lick his blood from the, from the ground. And then in verse 23, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Now we know that the prophecy of Elijah came to pass, and last week we went ahead and read all these verses. I'm not going to do that this morning for the sake of time, but if you want to look back at it, Ahab's death is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 35 through 38, and Jezebel's death is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Read it. But exactly what God said happened, would happen, happened. Exactly what Elijah told Ahab would happen, happened. When God, not, not necessarily right away, because God chose to wait a while. But it happened in his due time. And so, with all of that in mind, what is the application for us? What should we gain from uh, those verses? What should we gain from last week's lesson? Well, I think the main thing we can gain is sin has consequences. Folks, when you sin against God, there are consequences. So what do we do about that? Do we continue to walk in an ungodly way? If we're lost, do we continue to walk in sin? You know, lost people sin because that's what they are. They're lost. They don't know any better. And we must take the gospel to them. That's what the Lord has left us here for. If you are a born-again child of God, that's what we're supposed to be doing. All of us. Because there are lost people today who desperately need us to be faithful. And we're sitting around doing nothing while people die and go to hell all around us. But if you are, but for saved people who are not being faithful, for saved people who have strayed away from the Lord, there are consequences for sin, folks. I heard it said once. Sin will take you further than you want to go and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's a fact. That is a fact. For a lost person, if they don't get saved, they're going to die and go to hell. For a saved person, if they don't repent and turn back to the Lord, there's going to be some serious consequences. Folks, God doesn't play about sin. He is just. He's just. And He will do what His Word says He will do. So there are consequences. We must understand that. So what can we do if we find ourselves walking away from the Lord? If we find ourselves not walking in the Spirit, but walking in the flesh, what can we do? We must confess our sin and we must repent. The key word being repent. Folks, you can say every day, you can pray to the Lord every day, Lord, uh, I did this wrong today, please forgive me. And then tomorrow I did this wrong again, please forgive me. And tomorrow I did this wrong again, and please forgive me the same thing every day. That's not repentance. The definition of repenting is to confess that sin and turn from it. If we're, if we're committing the same sin every day, folks, we're not truly repenting. We're doing it over and over and we're confessing it because we know it's wrong, but we won't repent and turn from it because we like it. And that's what's wrong with us today. We know better, but we like what we do. We like our sinful life. And we won't turn from it. And that's why we're of no good to God. In fact, we're hurting the cause of Christ. When you name the name of Christ and you live like the rest of the world, you are hurting the cause of Christ. And you're hurting the ministry of this church because you're a member of this church. So I think the application for us is that sin has consequences. We must walk in the Spirit. Folks, if we had just turned loose of the sin in our life, confess it here at this altar, and get up and, 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 and confess it and repent here at this altar, and get up and go out in this, into this world and make a difference, a real difference in the lives of lost people, people that we work with, people that we come in contact with every day. Understand, though, there's pleasure in sin for a season. That's the problem. There's pleasure for a season. But folks, a day of reckoning is coming. 
we're going to stand before the Lord. Every one of us is going to stand before the Lord. And it is a fearful thing, the Bible says. Even for a saved person, it's a righteous person, it's a fearful thing. If you go standing there lost or you go standing there saved and not doing anything for God, living like the world himself, it's not going to be good. You know, we make jokes about it. As long as I get in. As long as I get in. Folks, if that's your attitude, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. Chances are, you ain't getting in. You're not getting in. Because you're not selling out to the Lord. You're playing the game. Churches are full of people today playing the game. Full of them. Playing the game. Be truthful with the folks that you love. Be truthful with lost people that you don't even know. You know, the truth hurts. Do you like to be told you've done something wrong? None of us do. Do you like to hear that something is not the way it needs to be in your life? Nobody wants to hear that. First thing we do is throw up that defense. Well, what are you doing? What authority do you have to come try to tell me what I'm doing wrong? Folks, the truth hurts, but it's exactly what we need to hear. Proverbs 27 and verse 6 says, Faithful are the words of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What does that mean? What does that mean? If a friend comes to us in Christian love as a brother in Christ, with a burdened heart about something that they see in our life, we ought to listen to them. We ought to take it as it's meant in love to help us. But you know, those people that pat us on the back and tell us how good we are, they're not our friends. See, we befriend the people that are really our enemy, and we kick the people that are really our friend to the curb and call them an enemy. What did Ahab say to Elijah when he saw him in, in the garden? I didn't read that verse this morning. But remember from last week, what did he say? When Elijah showed up in the garden of Naboth and Ahab was standing there, what did he say? He called him an enemy, didn't he? He called him his enemy. He's, he blamed everything that had happened, the drought, the famine, all that stuff, on Elijah. Was that Elijah's fault? It was Ahab's fault. Elijah told him this is what's going to happen. He was trying to lead him in the right direction, but he wouldn't hear it, and he called him an enemy. We're the same way today. The people that love you are the people that will tell you the truth. The people that pat you on the back and tell you how good you are, they don't love you. They're just trying to get along with you. Self-preservation. So as we get into today's lesson, we're going to talk about Elisha. Now today there's a lot of text I want to read, but it's pretty much, it's real self-explanatory. If, you if you've read the verses this morning, uh, you know, basically we're looking at the end of one man's life and the beginning of another. The end of one man's ministry. And I say the beginning of another. Elisha was already a grown man. But you know, your life starts over when you get saved, doesn't it? Starts over. You're born again. You're a different person. The birth of that new creature begins. Well, Elijah starts his ministry. So we're looking at, uh, we're looking today at the end of Elijah's ministry and the beginning of Elisha's ministry. And so, but I want, I want to point something out as we begin to look at it today, and this comes from 1 Kings, by the way, beginning in chapter 19, uh, if you want to turn there. But one thing in mind I want to mention this morning is there were 7,000 in Israel that had not bowed down to Baal. Elisha was one of them. Elisha was one of them. So with that in mind, we look at our text verses. Let's look at verse 19 and read through 21. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12th and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen 
and uh, gave unto the people, and they did eat, and he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. We see the call of Elisha. Now one thing I want to point out as we look at these verses here is Elijah went by and he cast his mantle upon Elisha. What did that mean? It's interesting to note, first of all, Elisha knew exactly what it meant, didn't he? Because he followed after him. It was symbolic. He was symbolically transferring his ministry to Elisha. Now keep in mind, Elijah didn't make this decision. God made it. God sent him to Elisha. That's the man. That's him. And he cast his mantle upon him. And what did Elisha do? Did he say, let me think about it? Did he say, boy, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to give up all I've got. I'm going to have to think about this a little bit. Did he say, let me go ask mom and dad? Did he, did he say, let me go ask my wife? Did he say, let me go ask somebody? He got up and he went after Elijah. The only thing he asked is that he be able to go back and tell his mom and dad bye. Goodbye. Look at, look at uh, uh, verse uh, 19, I believe. Let me flip back there. Verse 20. And he left the oxen and he did what? He ran after Elijah and he said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother and then I will follow thee. He didn't ask any questions. He knew what it meant. When that mantle was cast upon him, he knew exactly what it meant. He knew what he had to do. He knew what God was calling him to do. And he was ready to go. And then we look in uh, 2 Kings, and I want to, uh, I've got so much stuff marked in my Bible here this morning. I had a lot of things on my mind. But uh, let's look in 2 Kings here. Let me turn there real quick. I apologize. 2 Kings chapter 2, and I want to read verses 1 through 15. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Now our text in our, in our lesson just covers verses 12 through 15, but I think it's important to read these other verses, so let's read them. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 15. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were in Bethel came forth to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were in Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he, and he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that the two, they too rather, went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, look at this, Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and the horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, 
And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them into two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah and, that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were uh, to view in Jer at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now what we have here is a witness of the commission of Elisha. Elijah, his ministry, his time is over. And now it falls upon Elisha to be the prophet of God. It is a miracle how it's done. Elijah doesn't die. He is swept up in a whirlwind. Elijah is swept up in a whirlwind, and Elisha sees it. He actually saw a couple of miracles performed there, the parting of the waters and the fact that Elijah was swept up. But you know, as we look at these verses, I want us to think about something that I think is, is pretty important here. First of all, what happened, or excuse me, what did he ask for? What did he, Elijah told him, before I be taken away, Ask what you would have me to give thee or do for thee. And what does he say? He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for land. He didn't ask for good help. He didn't ask for fame or fortune. He asked for what? A double portion of his spirit. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what lay ahead. And all he wanted was the strength to do it and the spirit to lead it. Folks, we know what we ought to be doing today. We know what we ought to be doing. But how many times do we look for something other than the Spirit of God and the, and the Holy Spirit in us? We look for other things. We desire other things. And there's nothing wrong with having things. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, you know, we make things a lot more complicated than what they really are. We really do. We make things a lot more complicated than they really are. We got a lot of stuff we don't need. And a lot of times that stuff we don't need is what leads us away from God. The reason we find ourselves walking in the flesh and not in the spirit is because we've gotten so involved in things that are not, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but they're things that are leading us away from our service to the Lord. Folks, anything that leads you away from serving God is a hindrance. It's a problem, and it needs to be out of your life. I don't care if it's not a bad thing, you know, Playing golf, nothing wrong with playing golf, but if it takes you away from serving God, it's a problem. Nothing wrong with fishing, but if fishing takes you away from serving God, it's a problem. Nothing wrong with, with young people playing sports. I was a coach for 27 years. But if that keeps you from serving the Lord, it's a problem. It's a problem. And it needs to go. And so, you know, it, it, we, we, need to, we need to consider these things. Our service to the Lord. Elisha just wanted to serve God. He wanted the spirit upon him. That he might go out and serve the Lord and please God. And do what God would have him to do. Folks, that's what we ought to be desiring. That's what we ought to desire today. But Elisha took up the mantle that Elijah, that had fallen to the ground when Elijah was swept up. He took it up and he smote the waters and they parted and he walked across. But there were witnesses who saw it. And by seeing it, what did they do? When they saw it, they recognized that the Spirit of God was upon Elisha now. Elijah was gone, but Elisha, the prophet of God, the Spirit of God was with him. Look at verse 15. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The Spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. See, they had witnessed the commission of Elisha. They had witnessed it. They knew that it was of God. They knew that the spirit of Elijah was now with Elisha. The spirit of God was with him. That he was God's man. He was God's prophet. They recognized him as such. But you know, the next thing that we look at is the command of Elisha. What was his life like? What did he do? 
Folks, as a child of God, we've been given a commission. The Word of God contains the Great Commission, doesn't it? What are we commissioned to do? Somebody tell me, what's the Great Commission? Take the gospel, isn't it? To every creature, everywhere. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We've been commissioned. Elisha was commissioned. He spent some time preparing for his commission. He spent some time with Elijah, didn't he? He spent some time learning. He spent some time praying. He spent some time getting ready for his commission. Now, I say that to say this. How much time do we spend getting ready for our commission? Folks, if you go out, you know, if you're going to go out and, and share the gospel with people, and I, I, and I really believe this is part of the reason why we don't. I don't think it's fear that much. I don't think it's fear of rejection as much as it is. We're not willing to put the time in to study the word of God to know what to tell them. I don't want anybody to raise their hand, but I want you to think with me this morning. How many of you, as a born-again, saved child of God, read your Bible every day? How many of you, as a born-again, saved child of God, pray every day? I'm not, I'm not talking about the same old repetitive prayer. I'm talking about getting on your knees somewhere in a closet, somewhere by yourself, getting serious with God. How many of us do that? If we want to see the Lord move, if we want to prepare ourselves for the commission, what he's called us to do, folks, we've got to spend some time getting ready. You can't go out and tell somebody that they need something that either you don't have or you don't live like you have. You can't do it. They're not going to listen to you. It's kind of like us, like I said a few minutes ago. It's like when I'm standing up there this morning, if we sing, oh, how I love Jesus, I promise you, half of the people in here, or three-quarters of them, maybe all of them, you couldn't tell they love Jesus by the expression on their face while they say it. You can't tell it. And that's like you as a saved person going out and telling a lost person they need, the, they, they, they need Jesus, they need to get saved, while you got a frown on your face and living like the devil himself. They're not going to listen to it. We've got to prepare. And then when they ask questions, we need to be able to answer them. Now, I'm not saying we need to answer every question. Lord knows I, I can't. I don't know if anybody can answer every question. But if you'll study, if we'll study the Word of God and prepare ourselves, we ought to be able to tell some folks when they say, when they ask simple questions about salvation, we ought to be able to give them some direction. We ought to at least be able to point them to what they, where they can read about it in the Word of God. How many of us can even do that? Spend some time in preparation for the commission of what God's called us to do. We don't have, you know, we may not have a specific calling. God may not have called you to be a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist. God might not have called you to even teach Sunday school or anything like that. But we all have a commission. God has called every one of us to do something. And that's share the gospel. And folks, again, you can't share what you ain't got. You got to be real. Let's, uh, let's read these last verses here and look at Elijah's life. Beginning in verse 8, and I'm going to have to move quickly. Then the king of Syria warned against okay. Then the king of Syria uh, warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants saying in such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel saying beware that thou pass not such a place for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God had uh, told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. What's happening is the Syrians 
The king of Syria is attacking Israel, but they're always ready. They show up for a surprise attack, and it's not a surprise. How does that happen? Nobody knows but me and my people. Yet they're always ready. How is that? Look at verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? <laughs> Somebody in my camp is telling the king of Israel what's going on. Who is it? Who is it? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Now that's interesting. How does Elisha know what the king is saying in secret? Good question, isn't it? How does he know? And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. How many of us can say that? How many of us do say that? How many of us believe that? We're talking about being encouraged this morning. We ought to be able to draw encouragement from that. It don't matter what's coming against us. We're on the winning side. It's already won. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The Lord let him see why he didn't need to be afraid. Folks, the Lord can take care of his own. He's more than capable. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now, as we look at these verses, uh, we see an example of what God called Elisha to do. We see one example of Elisha's ministry. Now, clearly, in the years that followed, God gave Elisha a powerful ministry. Elisha was able to do a lot of things. He had the opportunity to preach the gospel to kings. He had the opportunity to preach the gospel to common people. He had an opportunity to preach the gospel to everybody, from the richest to the poorest, from all nations. God also empowered him to perform miracles. He performed some miracles that reinforced the word of God, that helped people to see, to confirm God's word. God allowed him to do those things. But he also showed concern and compassion for those around him. Folks, I think sometimes that's one thing that's missing today. Concern and compassion. We'll stand up and we'll tell folks, this is what you got to do, and this is what you better do, and if you don't do this, you're going to hell. And, but where's the concern and the compassion? Folks, there's people all around us that are hurting. There's folks all around us for whatever reason, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual. There are people all around us hurting. Where is our compassion? Where is our concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Where is our concern about the lost folks? How many of us in here this morning have called or visited somebody in this church this week? Just picked up the phone and called. How you doing? Stopped by to see them. Or in this world of... Uh, I'm, I'm way behind, but high tech for me sending a text message. So that tells you how, how far behind I am with technology. But how many of us even do that? Just send a text. Praying for you today, brother. That don't take long. But what an encouragement it is to do that. I got a text the other day. I was out in the sun. 
I'm out in the sun, and it was cooking. I was out on that field practicing, and I get a text from somebody who's been down, who's been through a lot, sent me a text. Love you, brother. I'm out in the sun baking, and I get that text, and I look at it. My first thought, who in the world is calling me now or texting me now? And I look at it. Boy, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. How many of us do that? How many, how many of us take time to do that? Where is our concern for one another? Where's our compassion? We act like sometimes we're scared to tell our brothers and sisters in Christ we love them. We act like we ain't got time to go see them. We act like we ain't got time. We, we don't have time to do anything. Folks, we, we're doing all we can do to get to church. That's what most of us, we're doing all we can do to get to church. And if that's all we're doing, we're not doing anything. Encourage one another. Lift one another up. Pray for one another. I know I need it. I need to be encouraged from time to time. I got a couple of guys in, in this class that will send me a text every once in a while. And it's always encouraging. Sometimes it's even funny. But, but that's good. We ought to do that. Then as we look on here, we see what happens when, it, when the king realizes his, his servants tell him that it's Elisha that's causing all these problems. That's why the, the king of Israel knows. He says, go get him. He sends a whole host after him, horses and chariots, and a whole host of people get one man. That tells me a little something. Tells me a little something. He knew what he was dealing with. He might not have wanted to admit it, but he knew what he was dealing with. So his servant, this servant of Elisha, gets up early, and he sees all this host of people coming. And he runs to Elisha. You can almost imagine what we're going to do. What are we going to do? He was scared to death. What did Elisha say? I believe he said, fear not, didn't he? Verse 16, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Who was on Elisha's side? The Lord. If the Lord's on your side, they that be with you is greater than they that be with them. Every time. Every time. Fear not. Folks, that's what we're talking about today. We don't have nothing to fear. We don't have no reason to walk around with a frown on our face because they that be with us is greater than they that be with them. That's something to smile. That ought to be encouragement today for every one of us. If you're a born-again child of God, they that be with us is greater than they that be with them. But you know, Elijah wanted his servant to see that. He wanted him to see it. It's one thing for Elisha to say it, but it was something else for him to see it, so he asked God to show him. And when he looked out, what did he see? Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes and uh, opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was filled with horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. There wasn't nothing to happen to Elisha. He was protected. He was protected. And this young man saw that. He was able to see it. And then he prayed that, the, that these men that come to get him be blinded. And the Lord blinded them. And if you read on, you find out that he delivered them to the king of Israel. They were blinded, and Elisha takes them to the king. But, but I want to say this about that, and I, and I, I know I've got to quit. But notice what happened. Did Elijah go out and swing a sword and cut the head off and defeat him? How did he defeat him? How did he defeat him? One man, a prophet of God, how did he defeat a whole host of Syrian soldiers with horses and chariots through prayer and faith in God? Through prayer and faith in God. Not military might, but prayer and faith in God. Are those tools or weapons that we have? We got prayer. And if you're saved and born again, you ought to have faith in God. If you've got faith in God and you'll pray, the Lord will take care of you. He took care of Elisha. I think that's the lesson for us to learn today. It don't matter what's all around us. It don't matter what we're being bombarded with. Prayer and faith. Prayer and faith is what we need. Those are two tools that we have 
in our tool belt or two weapons that we have in our arsenal if we'll use them. The problem is we have very little faith and we don't pray. We have very little faith and we don't pray. And when we do pray, we don't really believe God's going to answer it. That's because we have no faith. Folks, I'm going to leave you with this. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing he can't do. And we can't lose when we're on his side. If you belong to him, you can't lose. I don't care what anybody else tells you. I don't care what the world throws at you. If you're on God's side, if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you can't lose. So with that in mind, get a smile on your face. Love one another. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. And let's get busy serving the Lord. Working together to do that which he has called us to do. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have, Lord, to come to this place this morning to look into your word, to study your word. Lord, I'm thankful for the truth that we can learn if we'll pay attention, Lord, to your word and be diligent as we study. Lord, I pray that each one of us in here today would, Lord, uh, look to you and, 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 God, be thankful for what you've given us. And, Lord, trust you. Have faith, Lord, that you will do what you said you would do. And, God, that we'd pray. That we'd become a people that would uh, seek your guidance, seek your leadership, seek your will in our lives. And Lord, that we'd serve you with all that we have each and every day. And, God, that when we go out into this world, we'd live what we say we believe. God, that we'd be real for the people we come in contact with, and we'd love them enough to tell them the truth. Lord, I come to you this morning, God, and I pray for the services today. God, I pray for uh, Brother Mark as he comes and he leads us as we worship in song. Lord, I pray that we could tune the world out, that we could focus on your love for us and what you've done for us, and with a smile on our face, sing praises to you this morning. And God, I pray for Brother Mark as he leads us. And Lord, I pray for Brother Steve as he comes this morning. God, that you'd give him a message, Lord, that we stand in need of, and Lord, that each one of us would see where it applies to us, and that we could take uh, something from the message today and let it make us into the people that you'd have us to be. Lord, I pray for the moving of your spirit in this place this morning. God, I pray that if there be one lost here today, that today would be the day of their salvation. And God, I pray that if there be one just walking, and that's saved, that's walking in the flesh this morning, God, that they'd see the truth. God, that you'd convict them, Lord, of their need to, 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 to draw closer to you. Lord, to repent of their sin and turn back to you before it's, before it's too late. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and we ask these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Well, thank you all for your time and attention this morning, and uh, I apologize for being long-winded, but...